Welcome back to lesson 14. In the last part of this lesson, we defined polymer solutions as being dilute, semi-dilute or concentrated, and also recognised that in the last two of these categories, polymer chains could either be overlapping one another or tangled up in one another. We're now going to look at the first of two constitutive models that can be used to describe the viscoelastic response of polymer solutions. Both of these models are derived from molecular considerations rather than phenomenological ones, and we're going to examine the results of both of these models, but we won't be examining the derivations themselves as they are well outside the scope of this course. The first model that we'll examine is called the Rouse model, which can be used to describe the linear viscoelastic response of concentrated, unentangled solutions. So let's start by examining how we might go about modelling a polymer chain and see what physical phenomena the Rouse model incorporates. So we're going to examine something called a Gaussian chain. And a Gaussian chain is a model of a polymer chain where each segment of the chain can orient completely independently of any other segment. So let's put this in a little bit of context, both in terms of explaining what we mean by segments and orientation, but also by comparing whether or not this is realistic for a real material. So here on the board, I've put one of those beautiful atomic force microscopy images of poly 2 vinyl pyridine. Now, where I want to start is by thinking about the orientation of one monomer in relation to the monomer next to it. And if we think about the bonds that are involved, we've got vibration, we've got rotation, but we can see that the orientation of one monomer with respect to another monomer is going to be dependent on each other. You cannot orient one monomer completely independently of the monomer next to it. So if we're going to consider this concept of a Gaussian chain, we're going to have to consider a greater entity than just looking at the orientation of one monomer with respect to a different monomer. What we can do is we can take groups of monomers, maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe a few thousand monomers, and say, well, look, if I take a segment consisting of that number of monomers and compare it to a segment next to it consisting of the same number of monomers, then I can orient one of those segments independently of the other segments. All the degrees of freedom add up, and if there's a sufficient number of degrees of freedom, I can again randomly orient. So we have this concept of coarse graining. We're going from the molecular architecture of the polymer chain through to a slightly coarser description where the assumptions of a Gaussian chain can be used. So on the diagram on the board, I have put purple blobs to represent different segments of the polymer backbone, where I'm assuming that these different segments can now orientate independently from one another. Now, if you read the polymer solution rheology literature, each segment has a certain distance. And the distance between these beads, I've marked here as B on the board, is again sufficient to ensure random orientation segment to segment, but it has a name and it's called a Kuhn length. The number of Kuhn lengths we have to make up a polymer, polymer molecule is called the Kuhn number. So what we're going to do is approximate my molecular architecture of the polymer chain, in this case of poly 2 vinyl pyridine. We're going to coarse grain it by inserting a number of beads, those are the purple entities, and we're going to connect each of those beads together with a spring, and we're going to have n springs, and script n there is the Kuhn number. And the condition for doing this, and the condition for choosing how many springs and how many beads, is this random orientation. Now, when it comes to deriving the rheological behavior of such a Gaussian chain, we're going to need to know certain physical properties, like, for example, the spring constant. And in this case, the spring constant can be worked out using notions such as the Boltzmann constant, the absolute temperature, and that Kuhn length. So let's have a look at the first model that uses Gaussian chains. And this model is called the Rouse model. And so let's examine what physics the Rouse model incorporates. The first piece of physics is one 
that says that polymer chains are allowed to pass through one another in an unconstrained manner. And this relates back to the concept of a Gaussian chain. Each segment can orient randomly compared to the segments around it. And in the dotted box here on the board, you can see that I've got one polymer segment coming into it, and it kind of coils round in a fairly random kind of a way in that box, and one chain is indeed passing through another, and it's unconstrained in its motion. The next thing the Rouse model does is to examine the forces that exert on a single bead, and then sum them up across the entire chain. And in this case, what we're saying is if our beads are moving, then they're going to experience a frictional force due to that motion. The other thing that we're going to incorporate, because we're thinking on a molecular level, are forces due to Brownian motion. If we've got polymer and a solvent, that solvent is going to have Brownian motion, and that is going to impart a force onto the external entities around it. So the Rouse model includes frictional forces, it includes unconstrained motion of chains, it includes Brownian forces, but it does not include any notion of hydrodynamic drag. So the Rouse model will be limited in applicability to those situations where hydrodynamic drag is small compared to the other forces such as friction and Brownian. And what we find is, is that this model is very well suited to concentrated unentangled polymer solutions. So the polymer physicists um, will work through many, many pages of scary mathematics to go from that physical description of a coarse grained polymer chain to a final result, which is what we're going to look at. And the Rouse model predicts linear viscoelasticity. Let me put two key equations on the board for you. One that describes the elastic modulus G prime and one that describes the viscous modulus G double prime. I've highlighted a few parameters in these equations. Firstly, G naught, which is a modulus. And G naught here is dependent on the number of polymer molecules per unit volume, the Boltzmann constant and the temperature. And we can rework that into being a concentration dependence, a molecular weight dependence, and then RT, where R is a universal gas constant, T is absolute temperature. So that's what makes up G0. We also have relaxation times. We have N relaxation times, and big N here is the number of relaxation modes, not to be confused with big script N, which is the Kuhn number. And we'll see that different relaxation modes contribute to different types of behavior. But the key is that every relaxation time is linked to a common relaxation time, lambda r, the Rouse time. And if we're summing over n modes, we can see the relationship between the jth mode and the Rouse time in the equation in green on the board. Now, the Rouse time is dependent on notions of polymer configuration, the number of polymer segments, the number of Kuhn segments, the Kuhn length, and again, the Boltzmann constants and a measure of bead friction. But it's very unusual to be working that out from first principles. However, what we might do is estimate that from experimental data. So, if you're thinking that these equations look a little bit familiar, it's because they should do. The Rouse model is effectively a very similar result to multimode Maxwell, with a couple of caveats. Firstly, in the viscous modulus, we get the inclusion of the solvent viscosity now. Whereas with multimode Maxwell, we had no concept of the fact that we had a solvent present anyway, it was phenomenological, and so there was no notion of solvent viscosity. What we also find is that now just one modulus, G0, rather than a spectrum of moduli, GI, and that we find that the spectrum of relaxation times, lambda j, can be all related back to one single molecular relaxation time, the Rouse time. And the Rouse time can be a very useful time scale to look at the solution rheology behavior. And we can estimate the Rouse time by fitting g prime and g double prime to experimental rheology data. So, Let's have a look 
at a typical Rouse response for a polymer solution. Here on the board, I've plotted modulus on the y-axis, and that can be the viscous modulus and the elastic modulus, and angular frequency on the x-axis. I've plotted the g prime and g double prime parameters straight from the Rouse model, and I've taken 34 Kuhn segments, script n, an arbitrary modulus g0 of 313 Pascal, an arbitrary Rouse time of 330 microseconds, and an arbitrary solution viscosity of one millipascal second. Now, if we look at this plot, the thing to note is that we have effectively viscous dominated behavior at low angular frequency. And then we kind of get towards a critical angular frequency where you've got almost equal contribution of the viscous and elastic modulus. If one looks at the gradients of these lines, if we look at the viscous modulus first, the purple trace, G double prime, we can see it starts with a gradient of one and then ends up being a gradient of a half. If we look at the elastic modulus, it starts with a gradient of two and ends up again being a gradient of a half. So if you're taking experimental measurements of G prime and G double prime, and you end up with a plot that looks a little bit similar to this, one of the things that perhaps you might want to do is to fit the Rouse model to it and see if you can estimate the Rouse time. So, if we have a look at the upper region, what we find is that if we've got a clear upper region there where the gradient is a half, we can gain a quick estimate of the longest relaxation time in the solution. And that can be a very useful measure as well, since the longest relaxation time is probably going to determine, for example, how quickly stress will dissipate after a deformation has finished. So if we have a look at this in a little more detail, there on the board I have put the plots of modulus back, and I have now drawn a straight line in green through that region where both the viscous and elastic moduli have a gradient of a half. And in this region, I can effectively say that G prime is equal to G double prime minus the solvent viscosity contribution. And those two are both equal to this expression here, pi over two root two, g naught root omega lambda one. And so we should be able to estimate lambda one and g naught from these data. Okay, so let's recap a few key points. So we've looked at something called the Rouse model. And the Rouse model assumes a freely orienting polymer chain that can overlap on itself, a Gaussian chain. The Rouse model includes chain friction and it includes Brownian forces, but it does not include notions of hydrodynamic drag. When the derivation is complete, we get a very similar result to multimode Maxwell, except that we only have one modulus, G0, and the spectra of relaxation times can be related to one relaxation time, lambda r. And the applicability of the Rouse model is for concentrated and unentangled solutions.